if you were trapped on an island and forced to play in brutal children's games where all the losers are executed, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every death game in Squid Game. This guy is the unluckiest man in the world. Gion here has just gambled the last of his life savings on a horse track and manages to win 4 million won. Collecting the money from the teller, he runs out to spend his new hard-earned cash and steps outside to call his family with the good news. He's on top of the world, but that's when he notices a gang of loan sharks approaching him and realizes his luck has just run out. Panicking, he runs back inside to escape them, but crashes into this woman and falls to the ground, now realizing that this pickpocket has just stolen all of his winnings. The loan sharks finally corner him in the restroom to collect his debt, but when he checks his pocket, he finds it slashed open and his money has disappeared. With nothing to collect, they force him to sign his contract with his own blood, promising to pay them back in one month. Depressed, the gambler sits on the subway bench to wait for the next train home, when this businessman comes over to talk to him. He asks if Yun here wants to play a game, and the gambler thinks he's just an annoying salesman, but then he opens his briefcase, revealing stacks of cash and two folded paper squares. The salesman invites him to play the Korean game Dakji, promising to give him 100,000 won every time he wins, but he'll have to pay the salesman if he loses. It's a ridiculous gamble, but with everything to gain, Gyun decides he's in. The man places a folded paper on the ground, and the gambler tries to flip it over, but he only manages to make the red tile jump. He's failed, but when the salesman takes his turn, he flips it over on the first try. Gion tells the man he doesn't have the money to pay him, but the salesman offers to reduce his debt in return for one slap in the face. It's an offer he can't refuse, and desperate to win, he takes the slap to continue playing. He keeps losing each round, getting smack after smack, until finally, he throws down his tile and flips the salesman's paper over. Gion has just won a hundred grand for playing a children's game, but it's not as innocent as it may seem. Okay. First of all, let me just say that this guy here needs to be careful, because if any of these trains are going to Busan, then he's going to instantly regret it. Now as for Gyun here, accepting this game was a terrible idea. This man can't stop himself from gambling with money he doesn't even have, and against someone who walks around with a dachi in his suitcase and is clearly better at the game than him. Anyone with a brain wouldn't take that bet, but once Gion realizes that it's free money and only requires a slap in the face to keep playing, he doesn't stop to consider that this whole situation is suspicious as hell. Look at this guy's outfit here. This man is strictly on business, and since he approached him with such a specific agenda, it tells us he already knew that Gion is a degenerate gambler and is targeting him for some hidden reason. This salesman gave him every possible chance to make sure he's won some money from him, and nobody tries that hard to lose money unless what you're getting in return is much more valuable. Gion was too greedy to recognize any of these warning signs, and the man let his emotions get the better of him. Now, none of this guy's suspicious behavior matters if you had a proven strategy to play and win. Dakji is a game that Korean school kids play, and it's so popular that the game is even televised for mass entertainment. But it's not the strongest player who wins this game, it's the smartest and most coordinated. If you look at this player here, he manages to flip the paper in one try, and that's because he used the most surface area to make more contact with the other paper. If you can strike the target with the flat side of your Dakji paper, then the momentum will be transferred and carry the paper up on the bounce so that it flips over. This might seem counterintuitive, but it's just plain physics, and you can see this player was not successful because he was trying to use the edge, which is not a winning strategy. If Gion here had known the best way to play this game, he could hustle his businessman for all his cash and walk away without having to get slapped in the process. Now, even though he won, this one victory will soon lead the gambler to playing six of the most terrifying death games you could possibly imagine, and instead of a slap in the cheek, he'll soon be gambling with his life, but you don't have to. Your bank is giving you a hard time. You feel exploited, used, and your bank is partially to blame. You are tired of financial institutions hiding information from you. Who are you? What business of yours is all that? I am Current, the future of mobile banking. Wait, Current? Even the sponsor of this video that's giving away $5,000 to my viewers? Yes. And if your viewers download the app and use current code how to beat in the next couple of weeks, you will be sending 10 random people $500 each. Guys, if you don't know, current is banking you can do entirely on your phone with every feature you could possibly ask for. Early paychecks, spending insights, and instant notifications. There are no hidden fees, no hidden anything. It's so easy to use, and you also get a sleek Visa card like this one. The rest you can manage on the app and get rewards like points for cash back where you shop. Current takes away the hassle and confusion out of managing your finances. 
Because you guys signed up last time, they're sponsoring us again and giving out $500 to 10 more people who sign up. Go to the link in the description, cur.com slash cinema summary to download the app. And if you use the code how to beat, you might just win $500. Hurry, we don't have any spots left. Thank you, Current, for sponsoring this video. Gion here collects his winnings, and the salesman tells him he can win more money playing other children's games, but he turns down the offer. That's when the salesman stands up and reveals he knows the exact amount of money Gion owes to loan sharks and that he'll be killed if he doesn't pay it back. The gambler asks him how he knows this, and the salesman hands him a business card telling him to call if he wants to join the competition of a lifetime. Gion considers his offer, but this will be the biggest mistake of his life. Celebrating his newfound luck, he returns back home to have dinner with his mother, but the woman knows the money came from gambling. She tells him that his ex-wife is planning to move to America, and he'll only be able to see his daughter if he has the finances to prove he can care for her. gi is devastated, and realizing she's right, he decides to call the number on the business card, telling the salesman that he accepts his offer to play another game. Later that night, he waits outside to be picked up when a van pulls up to the sidewalk. Getting inside, he begins to notice that all the other passengers are asleep, but when the van starts to fill with toxic gas, the gambler realizes he's just f***ed up big time and gets knocked unconscious. When the man opens his eyes, he wakes up to find himself lying in a bunk bed, surrounded by hundreds of others and cots just like him. They're all wearing uniforms with numbers on them, and as everyone gathers in the center of the room, the front door opens and a team of guards walk inside. This man with a square mask tells them they will be playing in six different games, and those who make it through all six games will get a cash prize. This man demands to know why they were brought here, and the guard presses a button, playing a montage of several people being slapped. Everyone in this room is drowning in debt, and they've all been invited here to win enough money to pay it off. The players all line up to sign consent forms with three clauses, stating that they must keep on playing, that if they refuse to play, they'll be eliminated, and that the games can be ended if the majority of players agree to stop. Okay, there's nothing more dangerous than a room full of desperate people who have nothing to lose, and that's why the real threat are these players, not just the games. From the video that was played, we can see the Dakji salesman use the same trick on everybody, and they've only invited players who are willing to gamble money they don't have on a game they're unlikely to win. It's textbook psychological manipulation, and it proves this wasn't a game for cash. This was a test that everyone in the room passed, and now they know what we're willing to say yes to, which should scare the crap out of us. If we all agree to play for more money, then we can be sure that the penalty for losing is going to be a lot worse than a few slaps. Now, if you pay close attention to the details of this place, you'll realize that Gion here is about to have a really shitty day, because this place looks like a death camp designed by IKEA and H&M. Even refugee camps don't stack their bunks six beds high, and everyone is given a uniform with a number instead of their name, so their identities have been stripped from them, and it's an immediate red flag that this is going to become a death game. If prison rules apply here, then there are 455 other people who might kill you to get ahead, and it won't matter what game we're playing. The best strategy right now is to lay low, stay quiet, and observe our surroundings to gain more information to make sure we have a competitive advantage. A key thing to notice here is that these guards have different shapes on their masks, but this could indicate different work roles. The circles could be workers, and the square mask could be a manager of some kind. Recognizing power is extremely important because it helps you behave accordingly and pissing off the wrong person just might get you killed. Now, signing this contract is the cherry on top of the death game here because after being drugged against your will and kidnapped, this whole enterprise is completely illegal, which means the contract can't be binding. This is designed to create the illusion of choice and keep you playing even when things start getting really f***ed up. The fact that nobody here has realized this contract is meaningless tells us they aren't prepared for what's about to happen next. After being processed, they're all taken to their first game, entering an outdoor room with a massive clearing, and in front of them is a giant doll standing at the other end of the field. Gion here recognizes one of the players as his childhood friend, sang and walks up to say hello. Suddenly, the gates behind them lock shut, and the competitors are told they'll be playing the children's game Red Light, Green Light. Players must run to the finish line while the doll looks away, but if it looks back and catches them moving, they will be eliminated. They have only 5 minutes to cross the finish line, and with that, the game begins. The players start running across the field, but the doll suddenly announces red light before anyone expects it, and this player is caught completely off guard. It spots the man still trying to catch his balance, and a voice announces that he's eliminated. Suddenly, a gunshot rings out, and the player collapses to the ground, motionless. He's just been shot dead, and realizes they've been tricked into playing a death game, everyone starts running for the exits, but the doll is detecting every movement, and bullets start flying. By the time the shooting stops, over 100 people have been murdered and the surviving players are left frozen in fear. 
The doll turns its head back, announcing its green light, and the group starts moving again, determined to make it out of here alive. Using this guy like a shield, this girl cleverly falls behind another player to hide herself from the doll's sight. It's the same girl who stole the gambler's money earlier when he was running from the Lone Sharks, and without hesitation, she pulls the man down to launch herself ahead of the pack. Gion here tries to move forward, but he's grabbed by an injured player who begs him for help. One wrong move, and he's going to get him shot. But luckily, the doll turns back around just in time, and he breaks out of the man's grip. There's now one minute left, and the players are finally starting to reach the finish line. The man is only a few meters away from being this game, but just as he takes a step forward, he trips over a dead body. He's about to fall on the ground, but another player saves his life, holding him up until the doll announces green light. With only three seconds on the timer, Gion jumps through the air and finally makes it across the finish line. The remaining players who haven't crossed are all brutally shot to death, and the survivors look up to notice a massive roof close overhead. They have no idea they're on a private island in the middle of nowhere, and the only way out of here is to win. That's one game down, with only five more to go. Okay, this is the most horrifying children's game I've ever seen. But 001 here is having the time of his life because he understands something that everyone else is too scared to realize. This game isn't just about speed, it's about how much ground you can cover with enough stability to freeze at any given moment. With this in mind, the best method here is to walk with feet flat on the ground and a wide stance so our center of gravity stays low and stable. This old man was born for this moment because he moved with a very stable gait, and it's the best example of how everyone here needs to walk if they want to make it out alive. Now, we can't afford to be frozen in shock like Yun here because there's a lot of ground for us to cover in a very short time. This room is designed to deceive you into thinking it's smaller than it is, but there's a trick we can use to gauge the distance so that we know how fast we need to walk to reach the finish line before the clock runs out. Taking advantage of parallax and anatomy, you can actually use your thumb to figure out the length of the field. The space between your eyes is about one-tenth the length of your arm, so if you stuck your thumb out closing one eye after another, your thumb would appear to move one-tenth the distance as the guards are from where you're standing. You can actually try this right now by sticking your thumb out in front of you and closing one eye and then switching to the other eye to see your thumb move. If you do the math here, this trick tells us that we're at least 100 meters away. That means that this place is roughly the length of a soccer field, so if we want to make it across in 5 minutes, we can't afford to waste even one second. One of the biggest mistakes you can make here is looking at the doll instead of watching where you're placing your feet. It's important to remember that we aren't responding to visual cues here, we're listening for red light, green light. We can't risk tripping or accidentally losing our footing, so watching our feet helps us shut out unnecessary information so we can concentrate on stability while keeping our ears out for the signals. The next thing I would do is try to protect myself, and there's nothing more safe in a death game than finding a good old-fashioned meat shield. If we position ourselves behind another person, then it makes it much harder for the robot to detect any movement if we happen to flinch at a gunshot or react to another player dying close by, so walking behind someone is the best insurance we have to hide it. Now, the most dangerous element of this scenario is actually the other players trapped in here with us. We have to realize that we are extremely vulnerable to anyone who wants to kamikaze their way out of here. If you get pushed over, then they're taking you out with them, and it only takes one tiny movement to get you killed. So we'll need to stay far enough away from people that they can't interfere with their progress. The best way to do this is to position yourself along this wall. Natural human instinct is to seek comfort in crisis, and they might be drawn to the shade here, so to avoid the other players, I would use the sunny side of the wall instead. This also gives us another point of stability to help us stop in time, and we can make it to the finish line without getting killed. After the game, the guards come in to congratulate the survivors on passing, and announce that 255 players were killed. It's a horrifying number, and afraid for her life, this woman steps forward begging the man to let her go home. Several other players join her in protest, but that's when this massive piggy bank drops down above them and starts to fill with more cash than they've ever seen in their lives. The survivors are shocked, and the masked man tells everyone that they have an opportunity to win 45.6 billion won, but if anyone leaves, then they won't get a single penny. With that, a voting machine is set up in front of them, and they all cast their votes, but the majority of players agree to quit. The masked man tells them they can still come back if a majority agrees to compete again, and the players are sent back home. Now, it turns out that every single one of them realizes their lives outside are much worse than they remember, and Gion here returns to keep playing, but they're all going to instantly regret it, because this next death game is even more screwed up than the last. The vans take them to the private island, where a team of workers dress them into their uniforms, and the players finally wake up back in the same place as if they never left. 
Later that night, Gion talks of his childhood friend and suggests they team up for the next game to increase their odds of winning. The man agrees it's wise to join forces, and spotting the player who rescued him last game, the gambler insists this man join them too. That's when the old man asks if he can also be a part of their team, and Gion happily accepts him into the group, but his friend is not happy he invited someone so old to join their team. The next morning, all the players are led into a new arena, and as they pour in, they find an oversized playground in front of them. A voice instructs them to line up in front of one of the four shapes on the walls, and their choices are a circle, triangle, star, and umbrella. That's when Sang Woo here has a flashback to his childhood, and suddenly realizes what this game is, but the man doesn't tell anyone what he's just discovered. Gyun here asks him if they should all choose the same shape, but he rejects the idea, suggesting they should split up to reduce the risk. Finally, the doors open as the announcer instructs them to take a case from the tables, and the players find a thin piece of hard sponge toffee with a shape in the middle. They'll have to use the needle to poke out the shape in 10 minutes, but if they crack it, they'll be executed. The game begins, and Gyun here carefully starts breaking off pieces of the candy, but another player immediately cracks his honeycomb in half. Without hesitation, the guard pulls out his pistol and shoots the man dead, making him the first casualty of this game. It starts a chain reaction, as more people are executed without mercy. Gyun is sweating from the pressure. The umbrella is the hardest shape to cut, but suddenly the man has a revelation. Seeing the beads of sweat falling onto the candy, he realizes he might be able to melt it with his saliva from the bottom because the outline of the shape is thinner than the rest of the honeycomb. He starts to lick the toffee while other players begin to follow his lead, and with 12 seconds left on the clock, Gion desperately breaks apart his honeycomb, perfectly removing the umbrella from the mold. Despite all odds, he's won again. That's two games, with four more to go. Okay, this might seem easy, but if you pick the wrong shape in this game, you have an extremely low chance of surviving. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this candy is known as Taekwona, and removing the shape without cracking it is a very common game that Korean vendors play with kids, which is why the players recognized it as soon as they opened their tin cans. It's made out of melted sugar and baking soda, creating a unique structure inside which makes it hard to predict how it might crack. In fracture mechanics, this is known as strain energy, and when it releases, other micro cracks start to spread, making it crumble more easily. That is exactly what makes this game so challenging, because as careful as you are, it just might make your candy crack on you without warning, and you'll be shot in the face. The more sharp angles there are in the shape, the more you are likely to break it, and that's why Gion here is completely screwed, because he chose an umbrella which has the most angles by far. This teammate here told everyone to split up to spread out the risk, but if you think about it, his suggestion is total bullshit. Spreading out just makes it harder for the group to work together, because they won't be facing the same problems. For this reason, I would have suggested that we all select the same shape so that whatever solutions we can find, we can all benefit from them and win. It's clear that this guy is intentionally trying to get the other players killed in order to increase the prize pool for himself, and that's cold-blooded as hell. Now, there's still a way to increase your chances of choosing the right shape without knowing what the game is. Look at how these first two players rush in to select a shape before anyone else. Both of them chose triangle, and when nobody is supposed to know what the game is yet, it probably means they recognize the game from their childhood. Now, this doesn't guarantee that triangle is the best choice, but given they are so sure of themselves when the stakes are life and death, it's not unreasonable to assume that someone this confident has probably figured something out. If the players were unsure of their decision, they would take more time to think about it, and if you have no idea what the game is, following their lead is going to be your best option. Now, if it just so happens that we get stuck with the worst shape possible, there's still hope here, because the rules never stated that you could only use the needle, and that opens up a lot more possibilities to win. Using your saliva is a smart move, because getting it wet makes the candy softer, and you'll be able to cut the shape out without cracking it. This might seem obvious, but under a crazy amount of stress like this, it's hard to see other solutions if you're already told how you're supposed to solve them, and most of the players here were so fixated on using the needle, they didn't stop to think outside of the box. This is actually very similar to the candle problem, which was a famous psychological test in the 1950s. The subjects were given a table, a box of thumbtacks, some matches, and a candle. They were then instructed to stick the candle to the wall without letting any wax drip onto the table, but they have to come up with a solution as fast as he possibly can. What's interesting is that most of the participants didn't consider that the box itself could be used to solve the problem until their time ran out, and it had everything to do with time pressure and how the items were presented to them. We can learn from this by considering all the tools we have to work with, but none of these players realized they might be able to use the tin can here to solve their problem. Instead of licking the candy to death, they could have used the can to collect their liquids and soak the bottom of the candy way faster. All the players go back to the main room where the results of the second game are announced. 79 people were killed with 108 left standing, and that's now 34.8 billion won in the bank. 
Later, the players will gather for lunchtime, but when the last of them walk up to get food, they're shocked to find there's nothing left. Angry, the man yells at the guard for being unfair, but suddenly this girl stands up and points across the room, telling everyone that these players here cut the line to take seconds. The man walks up to the gangster and tries to pull the water out of his hand, but he's overpowered and the bottle shatters on the floor. Furious, this guy slaps him to the ground and starts beating him to death as the guards do nothing to stop him. All of a sudden, the scoreboard announces another player has died, and the total cash prize goes up by 100 million won. A couple of guards walk in to take the body away while everyone stares in horror, realizing that this game just got a lot more dangerous. Later, Sang Woo here tells his team to stay awake tonight in case they're attacked. The other groups are preparing for a fight, but Gyun here notices this girl across the room and recognizes her as the pickpocket who stole his money. The man approaches and invites her to join the team, but she rejects his offer, insisting no one here can be trusted. That night, they all get into their beds and nervously wait for the guards to leave the room. Once the lights are turned off, several people slowly begin to leave their cots, searching for an easy kill. Suddenly, this player panics as the thug grabs her and stabs the woman to death. This one murder causes a chain reaction, and all the other players begin killing each other for cash. Gyun and his team try to defend themselves, but that's when they hear the old man begging everyone to stop fighting. And when the lights turn back on, the guards run into the room, putting a stop to the madness. Okay, this just might be scarier than the actual game so far. There are no rules or restrictions here, and when you're literally worth more dead than alive, everyone in this room has a motive to kill you. Now with that said, this is actually the best thing that could possibly happen. There were a total of 27 players who died in the chaos, and while those are better odds than any of the death games so far, this wipes out a lot of the competition that we would otherwise be facing in the next challenges. All we have to do is survive the night, and the other players can kill each other off for our direct benefit. The best strategy here is to run to the corner of the room and defend your position with a group of friends. This might seem counterintuitive, but when it's completely dark and you can't see who's coming for you, being cornered in like this leaves you with only 90 degrees of vulnerability. And that's much better than being in the middle of the room where you would have a full 360 degrees to be attacked from. If you don't have a group, then we should be hiding under one of the bunk beds as soon as the lights go out. The killers won't be able to look for anyone in hiding because it's too dark to see. So this just might be the only time I'll ever tell you that hiding under the bed is a good idea. And hey, I don't mind being called a coward if we end up outliving everyone else as a result. The next morning, all the players wake up, but Gyun here notices how tired the old man is and finds out he stayed up all night watching over the team in case someone attacked them. He's exhausted, but there's no more time to rest because the third game is about to begin. The players are led into a white room where they're told to divide themselves into groups of 10. Sang Woo here realizes that a team game could mean it's a physical challenge, and thinks they should find stronger men to join them. The group splits up to search for more players, but with time running out, they only manage to bring in the outcasts, realizing that three skinny women and an old man could put them at a severe disadvantage. The groups are taken into another room where they see two massive platforms, and they're told that today's game is tug of war. They'll need to pull on the rope until the other team falls off the platform to their deaths, and the guards draw lots to decide who will go first. When it's finally their turn, Gyun and his team stand up to see who they'll be facing, but find that their opponents are all stronger than them. They're completely outmatched, and know they won't be able to beat them with brute force. But as they ride the elevator up to the platform, the old man tells them he knows exactly how to win. Gyun takes a position at the front to act as a leader, with the strongest player at the very back. The group stands on alternating sides with their feet pointed forward, and as soon as the game begins, they all lean back as far as they can, using their whole body to pull on the rope. With this technique, they're able to get the advantage within the first 10 seconds and tug the other team closer to the edge, but it doesn't last for long. Their opponents gain their second wind, and the group loses their footing as they're dragged closer to the edge of the platform. But that's when Sung Woo here has a brilliant idea. He yells at everyone to take three steps forward at his signal, and with no other plan, they do as he says. The group steps forward, knocking the other team off balance, and it sends them tumbling to the ground. Now with the advantage, Gyun's team is finally able to pull the others off of the platform, and as the blade cuts through the rope, the players collapse, just happy to be alive. That's how three games they've won, and there's only three more to go. Okay, for anyone who's picked last in gym class, this one has got to bring back some painful memories, because it's immediately clear that the biggest and strongest players are going to dominate in this game. If you're weak or old like these guys, you're at serious risk of getting your whole team killed. Now, I'm not going to say that they won just because they had plot armor, but if I were them, I'd be looking for every possible way to cheat, because of the players we have, it's going to be our best chance at surviving. 
Now, the truth is, this isn't just a children's game. Tug of War used to be in the Olympics from the years 1900 to 1920, and to this day, the International Olympics Committee still recognizes it as an official sport. If this seems like trivial information, I assure you it's not, because unlike silly children's games, an official sport has tons of rules, with governing bodies to make sure that the game is being played fairly. The reason this is important is because these rules are created to prevent teams from gaining an unfair competitive advantage. Now, if that doesn't put a smile on your face, then you're not paying attention. Because in a death game like this, unfair competitive advantages are everything we could possibly want to stay alive. In a death game, official sport rules are basically a gift wrapped instruction manual for how to cheat and win because the workers are not going to be holding a training camp on proper tug of war techniques and there's no referee on this platform. If we know what the official rules are, then it's reasonable to assume that we can break them without getting punished for it. The first rule I would break is called locking. This is usually done by placing your elbow behind your thigh and it locks up any back and forth movement in the rope. Normally in tug of war, your hands are the only point of contact with the rope and it means that your arms are doing a lot of work. But locking helps you easily use your entire body's weight to pull with and this rule break makes it much harder for the other team to win. Another form of cheating is for the player in the back to use what's called an anchor grip where they wrap the end of the rope around their torso. This allows the last player to concentrate on using his full body to pull without even needing to place his hands on the rope. There are tons of tug of war rules that we can break here that will give us an unfair advantage and it's the best way for a team like this to win no matter what. Now, if we're about to lose, we're going to need a Hail Mary tactic and the best thing we can do is to have the whole team shift to one side while the player in the back ties the rope to this metal bar here. This doesn't violate any of the rules stated by the square mask and if we keep pretending to pull while letting our arms recover, the other team will have no idea we're cheating and they'll blow their muscles out. These anchors can also be used as footholds instead of relying on the friction of the floor to push off of. The next morning, the players are brought to another room where they're given instructions for the next game. They will need to pair up with one other person and they have 10 minutes to find a partner. The players immediately start looking for anyone that will help them win, but Giyun here notices that they're all ignoring the old man. Approaching him, he reaches out a hand offering to be his partner and the two join up. By the end, the only person who doesn't have a partner is this woman, and with an odd number of players, everyone else leaves for the game while she's dragged away by the guards. Inside the arena, the players are led through a room that looks like an old Korean neighborhood and are each given a pouch filled with 10 marbles. The old man tells his partner that he was good at playing with them as a kid, but makes him promise to be Ganbu, best friends if he wants a chance to survive this game. Suddenly, an announcement tells the players they must use the marbles to play a game of their choice and take all 10 of them from their partner in order to win. Sang Woo here decides to play a game of odds or evens and his partner has never played before, but after only a few rounds, Ali here manages to get the better of him, winning all but one of his marbles. The man is devastated and he begs his partner to help him survive, asking for one last chance to play against the other teams to take their marbles instead. His partner decides to trust him and that's when Sang Woo asks for the man's pouch. Placing it under his jacket, he secretly switches it out with his own before stripping his shirt to create a sling. Hanging his pouch around the man's neck, he tells him to go searching for others to play against and the man leaves. With his partner gone, he puts his last marble in the full pouch he stole and hands it over to the guard becoming the winner. It's a filthy trick to play, but he did what he needed to survive. Meanwhile, Gion plays against the old man, cheating in each round until he's down to one less marble. Realizing he's about to lose, he decides to surrender to his best friend and Gion breaks down in tears. With all 10 marbles, he walks away the winner as the old man gets killed and with 4 games down, there's only 2 more to go. Okay, this death game has a lot more possibilities than any of the other challenges because for the first time, we get to choose how we want to play. Now, the danger here is that there's only 30 minutes on the clock, and if your partner refuses to continue, you'll run out of time before you've won all their marbles, which will get you killed. Playing a single all or nothing round will solve this problem, but it's a risky strategy, because if you lose, there's no way to win your marbles back. Now, these guys here are playing the game odd or even, where your opponent guesses if the number of marbles in your hand is odd or even, and if they guess right, they get to take them. Winning this game is based on pure chance, and for someone as smart as Sung Woo here, he should have realized that this game would give him no way to use strategy to gain an advantage. Instead of games of blind luck like this, we should be looking for something that your opponent thinks they can win, but that you know you can win, and for that, there's nothing better than an ancient Chinese game called Nim. 
This game has been around for centuries, but what makes it special is that there's actually a proven strategy to guarantee a victory. If you're not familiar with the game, this is how to play. First, we combine our 20 marbles together into a shared pile and take turns removing either one or two marbles at a time. Whoever removes the last marble gets to keep all of them and wins the game. It's so simple that you'd think there couldn't possibly be a strategy here. But the key to this game is to always go first and remove exactly two marbles. Then, whatever they remove, you remove the opposite. For example, if they remove two marbles, then you remove one. And if they remove one marble, then you remove two. If we keep this going, then you're guaranteed to remove the last marble and you'll never lose. Most people don't know this mathematical trick exists, and that's why it's the perfect game to choose in this situation. Because when our victory depends on another player's cooperation, we can use Nim to trick anyone into agreeing to play, and they won't realize they've lost until it's too late. Now, it might be that there's just not enough time to waste in playing a full game of Nim, because the longer it takes your opponent to make decisions, the more he puts you at risk of getting executed. If that's the case, then we should follow this guy's dirty tactics and steal our partner's marbles. To do this, we should ask for their pouch in order to set up the game. But once they've handed them over, just go straight to the guard and declare you've met the win conditions. The other player will probably attack you in protest, but violence is not allowed in this game and your opponent will be threatened at gunpoint if he does. Once you have his marbles, there's nothing to stop you from winning and in a death game like this, we have to consider every tactic at our disposal if we want to stay alive. The victors return to the main room and they're all surprised to see that this woman is still alive. She explains that since she had no one to pair with, the game let her skip the challenge, and after everything they've been through, the others are furious. The next morning, all the players wake up to a group of guards coming in with a coffin, and Gyun here realizes that one of their fellow players decided to quit during the night. Looking up, they watch as the man's life turns into cold hard cash, and that's when the PA announces that the fifth game is about to begin. The group is taken to a room with a row of mannequins wearing numbered vests, and they're told to each choose one for their next challenge. Rushing in, everyone gets their pick, but when Gion finally steps up to choose, the only vests left for him are numbers 1 and 16. He considers taking number 1, even though that means he'll go first, but this player asks to have the number instead, and he agrees to let him take it. Finally, they're brought into the game room, and the announcer tells them they will be playing glass stepping stones. They must remove their shoes and walk over tempered glass to make it across the bridge, but if they step on a panel made from regular glass, they'll fall to their death. With 60 minutes on the clock, the first player takes off his shoes and approaches the bridge. Nervous, he jumps to the first tile and makes it, but when he moves on to the second, the man falls straight through the glass. Horrified, the other players have no choice but to continue, and more people start crossing the glass bridge. One by one, they plummet to the ground as they slowly reveal a path of stable panels for the others to follow. With the first eight players dead, it's now the gangster's turn to lead the group, but he refuses to move on, telling the others to go before him if they want to pass. Everyone behind him starts to panic. They still have five panels left and are quickly running out of time. Suddenly, the gangster comes face to face with this woman and she mocks him for being a coward. Jumping onto his platform, she locks her arms around him, threatening to pull him off the ledge if he doesn't continue. But before the gangster knows it, they break through the glass panel as they both fall to their deaths. With only a handful of survivors and less than three minutes left, this man crouches down to inspect the panel in front of them. Sangu begs him to keep on moving, but he reveals that he was a glassmaker for 30 years and can tell which panels are tempered from the reflection. The man jumps forwards onto a stable panel and they realize his theory is working, but that's when the game decides to make things more challenging and turns off the lights so they can't tell the difference. Panicking, Sangu here realizes they won't be able to see the reflections anymore, but the glassmaker has one last trick up his sleeve. He asks for something to throw at the panels, explaining that tempered and regular glass make different sounds. Hyun here passes over the marble he still has, and the glassmaker tosses it in front of him. But with less than 25 seconds remaining, Sang-woo decides to take matters into his own hands. He pushes the man forward, shattering the glass into pieces, and with the path clear, they all make it to the other side. When the timer hits zero, the remaining glass panels suddenly explode and the shards go flying through the air, injuring the three survivors. That's now five games down and one more to go. Okay, this glassmaker was a total badass. He could have saved all 16 players if he shared his knowledge in the beginning, but he knew that keeping his mouth shut would eliminate his competition and it was a bother move. The only mistake he made was not waiting longer because once he revealed his strategy, the game removed his advantage and all it took was one greedy man to kill him off. Now, having said that, this game is different from the previous challenges because it's not a test of skill or strength. When you have no information to base your decision on, choosing the right path here makes this a game of random chance. 
If you look here, you'll see that there are 18 pairs of panels. So this first player has a 1 in 262,144 chance of making it across this bridge. This is basically a death game lottery with odds that I wouldn't play under any circumstances unless I found a way to cheat. By the law of averages, it's fair to assume that each player will probably step on two panels before dying, with one correct guess and one wrong one. That means on average, 9 players will need to die in order to cross all 18 of them. If the majority of the players are going to die, then it might be the perfect time to convince them to vote on leaving the competition. This death game is like telling someone that if they don't win the lottery, they'll get murdered. And when you put it like that, it's kind of ridiculous that the first players even attempted to play. Now, if we actually choose to play the odds, we're going to have to cheat if we want any chance of making it to the next round. I'm not an expert glassmaker like this guy here, but all I need to know is that if you throw something through a window, it's going to break. That's exactly why I would have collected these shoes here, take my jacket off, and tie a knot at the end of the sleeve. Then, place a bunch of shoes inside so that we can swing it in front of us to test if the glass will break or not. If it cracks, then I jump to the opposite panel and continue until I reach the end. If for some reason this method fails, we can also try walking on the metal bars here instead of the glass. Now this might be considered unacceptable to the game designers, but if someone doesn't try it, we'll never know if it's allowed or not. The only win condition for this challenge is to make it across the bridge, and we've already seen other games where the players are able to manipulate the rules to their advantage. If you remember in the last game, Sang Woo here tricked his teammate into giving him the marbles instead of playing for them. And when things get desperate, these are the kinds of tactics that we need to start using. If we don't test the boundaries of what's allowed in each and every game, then we might be missing out on some of the best strategies that will keep us alive for longer and it's a terrible waste of an opportunity. Later, the players are rewarded for surviving to the final game and given the first real food they've had in days. Starving, the men dig into their steaks, realizing this could be the last meal of their lives. When they finish eating, the staff leave them with their steak knives, and by all appearances, this next game is going to be a vicious fight to the death. That night, Gion here decides to approach the girl to talk. He asks her what she'll do if she survives, and the girl reveals she wants to get her mother out of North Korea so their family can reunite. It's a touching moment, but suddenly Gion looks over and notices the other player slouching in his bed. He's fallen asleep, and the man realizes he's got the perfect opportunity to kill him. Pulling out his steak knife, he's about to step forward when the girl stops him, insisting he shouldn't play this way. He hesitates, but the man knows she's right and puts the knife away. That's when he hears the girl gasping and turns around, shocked to find her leaning over in the bed, and realizes she was injured by the flying glass in the last game. Worried, he runs over to the front door and screams at the staff to treat her wounds. To his surprise, the lights suddenly turn on as the workers enter the room carrying a coffin, but they aren't here to help. Gion looks behind him and sees Sang Woo standing over the girl's bed, and his knife is soaked in her blood. Furious, Gion goes to attack him, but a guard intervenes, shoving the player to the ground, and as he screams in fury, the coffin closes over the woman's body, leaving the final two players left with one last game. Okay, this was devastating, but we all should have seen it coming. Sang Woo here has managed to stay alive because he's the most cold-blooded player in the game, but that's why he was 100% correct to kill this woman. He realized that with three players left, there was a huge risk that if the others banded together, they would have a majority. Using the third clause of the contract, this will let them force a vote to quit the game, and he wouldn't be able to stop them. If they were me, I wouldn't let that happen under any circumstances because we've come way too far to give up now. That's why he took matters into his own hands before it got that far, and it was a brilliant move to make. Now to be fair, this girl was already bleeding out, and was simply not strong enough to compete in the next game. Her only options were to kill the men during the night, or to force a vote and return back to the mainland. Both of these benefit nobody but herself, and Gion here seems to keep forgetting that he's a finalist in a f***ing death game. Sang Woo just did him a huge favor and wiped out 33% of the competition, so as heartless and cold-blooded as it was, the man did exactly what he had to do. The two men are taken to a corridor where their toy coin will be flipped to decide who will be defending or attacking. Picking triangle, Gyun here wins the toss and chooses to play offense before the players are finally told that for the last round, they will be playing Squid Game. As the attacker, Gyun must enter the squid-shaped court and tap his foot inside a circle on the other end to win. The defender wins if he manages to toss the attacker out of the court, but any kind of violence is allowed, and the last person standing will be the winner. Suddenly, the sky goes dark and it starts to rain as the two players take their positions. Determined to get vengeance for the girl, Gion here walks towards his childhood friend and starts swinging his knife, but the other player manages to get him in a chokehold. 
The two men go at it, and as the players get locked into a wrestling match, his opponent picks up his knife before stabbing Gyun deep into the thigh. He kicks the other player away from him, but with his injuries, he can barely defend himself. The man walks up to him and tries to end his life, but Gyun won't give up, catching the knife at the last second and bites his ankle, forcing the man to back off. Exhausted, he climbs over his friend and beats him into the ground. Song Wu is too weak to continue, and even though he has the perfect opportunity to kill him, Gyun spares his life. Getting onto his feet, he asks the guard about clause number 3 and if they are still allowed to end the game if both players agree to quit. He then offers a hand to his friend, telling him they can both go home, but the man decides to sacrifice himself, letting Gyun win by default. He's completed all 6 games and earned 45 billion won, but has just lost his friend in the process. Okay, Song Wu took the honorable way out, but to be fair, this guy had it coming to him because he was just about the worst childhood friend you could ever ask for. First of all, he tricked Gyun into picking an umbrella in the second game, knowing that it might get him killed. And he also stole his other teammates' marbles, which was downright disrespectful. Now having said that, we cannot get emotional like Gyun here, because this kind of behavior will backfire on you quickly. He's furious that Sangu killed the girl, but it's distracting him from his priorities of staying alive and finding strategies to win this last game. Now, if the man had kept his cool, he would have noticed that on the walls of the room were images that told him exactly what the next game would be. These pictures have been here the whole time, and if Gion had noticed this drawing of the Squid Game court with only two players inside, with that kind of evidence, all you need to know is how to play Squid Game to figure out what tactics will give us our best chance to win. So let's break down how this game actually works. First, there are two sides, an offense and a defense. The attacking players begin the game by trying to run across the court here while the defender tries to stop them. If they succeed, the game enters stage 2, and the attacker must run through this narrow gap and break the defense, but only wins by tapping his foot on this tiny space. Lastly, if he gets pushed out of bounds by the defender, then he loses. Now that you know the rules, imagine if you're the attacker trying to run through this gap. Except this time, the defending player here is holding out a steak knife. This is why choosing to play offense is a terrible strategy, because they're actually not playing Squid Game at all. They're playing a new game called Kill Your Childhood Friend. The fact that they are both given steak knives completely changes how we should be thinking about this. To put it another way, if sumo wrestlers were allowed to use steak knives in competition, they would have to completely change their regular strategies in how to play and win. In this scenario, Gyun has to make it through this tiny opening without getting stabbed, but all Song Wu has to do is push him out of the court or kill him. Choosing the defender is going to give you a better chance to win, because the knife makes it almost impossible to enter the gap without getting seriously injured. If I were him, I would even try standing where the opponent is supposed to tap his foot. This lures the attacker closer to the edges of the court here, and we might be able to throw him out of bounds to win the game. It doesn't require nearly as much energy, agility, or endurance as the offensive player needs to have, and that's why Gi-hun made the worst possible choice. Now this is not the only mistake that he made, because even while the game was being played, he was so caught up in gaining revenge that he completely forgot the main objective. This man had several opportunities to run through the gap and tap his foot on the circle to win, but he completely ignored it and continued fighting. It's the same problem he had at the beginning with the Dakji player, because when he finally won and flipped the paper, he was so caught up with his emotions that he wanted to return the slap and forgot that he was playing for 100,000 won. It's Gyun's worst character flaw, and it nearly cost him his life. He's taken back to the mainland and dumped on a sidewalk with a special debit card as a reward. When he puts it into an ATM, he discovers it's full of the prize money from the death game. One year later, Gyun here is miserable and hasn't touched any of the money he won. But as he's sitting on a riverbank, a woman asks him to buy one of her flowers before they wilt. He pays for a single rose and she gives it to him, but then he discovers an envelope was attached to it with a pink ribbon. Opening it, he finds out it's a Squid Game business card for the old man, inviting him to a reunion in the city. Going to the address, he enters his building and is shocked to find the old man lying in a gurney. He's somehow still alive, and Gyun demands an explanation about who he is. The old man tells him he created the death games, and the only reason he joined was so that he could feel like a kid again. Gyun is completely disgusted, but the old man dies before he can answer any more of his questions. Several days and one crazy haircut later, he's traveling to the airport to visit his daughter when he spots someone slapping a guy on the platform, and he realizes it's the Dakji player who gave him the business card. Furious, he runs over to the other side of the tracks to confront the man, but he's already gotten the train and left. Gyun here walks up to the person he was playing with and sees he was given a card. Taking it out of his hands, he discovers it's an invitation to the death game. Later, he's about to board his plane and decides to call the number on the card. 
He demands to know who the kidnappers are, but the person on the other end tells him to get on board. That makes Gion furious, and he turns back around, deciding to stop the Squid Game before more people get hurt. But what do you think? How would you beat Squid Game? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day. Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul aka Billy the Squid and this video we're breaking down the brand new Netflix show Squid Game. It's an absolutely incredible first season that's filled with lots of twists and turns and throughout this video we're going to be going over the story, ending and what could be happening in season 2. Full spoilers ahead so it's your choice whether you want to proceed beyond this point but I warn you there's no turning back. If you enjoy the video then please smash the thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe for breakdowns like this each and every day. Without the way, thank you for playing, now let's get into season 1 of Squid Game. Okay so Squid Game follows Ji Hun, a man who's down on his luck after losing just about everything that means something to him. His marriage failed, he lost his job, is in deep over his head with gangsters and now faces the fact that his daughter is going to be leaving South Korea with her mother and new family. To make matters worse, his mother is also at death's door and she requires medical attention in order to save her life. Seems like things are going worse than this channel is, however his fortune seemingly changes when he meets a man at a train station that offers him the opportunity of a life and death time. Desperate for money, Ji Hun finds himself somewhat squidnapped and drafted into a battle royale between himself and 456 contestants. Or was it 455 because they're counting him? Look, either way, it's worth a grand prize of 45.6 billion and obviously everyone's desperate to get their hands on it. Throughout we watch as the players are whittled down to one in games of red and green, honeycombs, tug of war, deadly hopscotch and one that will have you losing your marbles due to the betrayals in it. The season is a blast to watch and early on it sets up this idea of division within colours that thematically ends up coming full circle by the end. The colours red and green are introduced and these are actually classed as opposites on the colour spectrum. Both are mentioned in the passwords, they become the name of the first game and even the contestants wear green whilst the gods don red. This show is absolutely laced with these opposing colours and they in many ways very much represent the divide between the powerful and powerless. As we know from our own society, this divide is often showcased between the rich and poor and we learn that there are a vast number of wealthy men who actually oversee the entire operation and that this is all for their entertainment. Rather than being seen as people, the players are very much just numbers and this is demonstrated in the fact that they are literally given these as their names. Along the way Ji Hun meets an elderly man named Number One and the fact that he's the first drafted into the game should give you a clue towards his true identity at the end. Ji Hun is the last number and throughout the season we watch as he very much works his way down to Number One. At one point Number One even ends the game and gives the survivors of the first round a chance to go off and live their lives but they all return desperate for the money. In the end all that remains are Ji Hun and Sang Woo, two childhood friends who led very different lives but both found themselves in the same spot come the end of the game. The final competition is the titular Squid Game and we watch as the thing they played as children decides who will live and die. It's an awesome final battle and they even bring some rain in in order to add some dramatics to the showdown. Ji Hun bests Sang Woo but rather than killing him he brings up the clause that if both players forfeit then the game will be null and void and thus they'll both get to go home. This will be for nothing but Ji Hun would rather put a stop to the death than gain the money. However rather than forfeiting, Sang Woo ends his own life because of what he's done when playing. All he does is make Ji Hun promise that he'll look after his mother and then he stabs himself leaving Ji Hun as the last man standing. Now whilst this is going on, we see a police officer whose brother disappeared investigating the island in an attempt to learn his fate. Throughout he sees things from the other side but a big twist comes towards the end when we learn that his sibling is actually a character known as the front man who's running the operation. He attempts to alert the police to the whereabouts of the island as well as what's going on but the fact that the game is still continuing at the end lets us know that the operation wasn't shut down. Now one of the big questions surrounding the series is whether he survived or not. Towards the end of the season he's shot and though the character takes a tumble off a cliff into the ocean, we never actually see a body and therefore we can assume that he's still alive. Huang Jun Ho is only shot in the shoulder, much like his brother and with the front man not dying from the wound, 
it is likely that his brother didn't either. However, we do know that he didn't shut down the Squid Games, so it'll be interesting to see how he's brought back in future seasons. Now after the prize money is given to Ji Hun, he returns home but upon getting there finds that his mother has died. Due to him participating in the games, he wasn't there for her in her final few days and it's a devastating ending that feels like a real gut punch in what was an already extremely brutal series. It's at this point that we pick up one year later and discover that Ji Hun is still living life in the exact same manner that he was before he won. The money he sought after for so long was actually worth nothing to him in the end and the real people who meant something to him were lost whilst he tried to seek out these riches. It's very much a case of the only thing worse and not getting what you want is getting it and he's trapped in a state of grief by himself with life having lost its meaning. At this point he's given a card which is similar to the one that started everything off and on the back of it he finds an address which leads him to an apartment. Here he finds number one bedbound and we learn that he was actually behind the entire game. Much like Ji Hun, possessing all that money ended up meaning very little to him and in his boredom he created the games in order to entertain himself and his rich friends. He lived life believing that people wouldn't help one another and uses a drunk man across the street as confirmation of this. In his last few moments he plays one final game in which the pair bet whether anyone will stop to help him and because of their choices we see the cynicism within number one. Now number one, or rather Il Nam, only believed in the worst of humanity and his entire life led him to think that people were all self-centered and only interested in, well, their own interests. However, as he dies, we see that people actually arrive in order to help the man across the street and it's very much an F you to him in his final moments. Now we never learn whether Ilnam sees this, but in all honesty, it doesn't really matter. His entire life ended up becoming dedicated to the idea that he didn't need to help others because other people in his position would also be just as selfish. Ilnam could have shared his wealth with anyone at any time but he believed deep down that people were all as bad as each other and that if they were where he was that they wouldn't help him either. This was somewhat shown in the game of marbles in which Ji Hun lied and cheered in order to get ahead. Though we will never know whether he knew of the drunk man's fate or not, it really doesn't matter as this moment inspires Ji Hun to do something with the money rather than letting it go to waste. Ji Hun gets a haircut and has it dyed red, showing that he is somewhat the one that is in the position of power now. Rather than being a malevolent D head like the rest of the Reds though, he takes a player's brother out of an orphanage that she wanted to rescue him from and places him in Sang Woo's mother's care who he makes extremely rich. He lives up to his two promises and though it seems like a happy ending, it's all quickly cut short when we realise that the game is still going. Though Ilnam died, the game didn't die with him and at a train station he comes across the man who recruited him, played by Gong Yu. You might recognise him from the seminal horror train to Busan and I believe that come the second season he will play a much bigger role. He is clearly still tied into the operation and Ji Hun takes the card from the person he was attempting to rope into the game. The season closes out with Ji Hun about to board a plane to LA in order to see his daughter but after calling the number on the card he comes to the conclusion that the game is still going and that hundreds more people will die if he doesn't step in and do something about it. He tells the front man that he's coming for them and this of course carries a lot of weight for season 2. Now I believe that Ji Hun will meet with Huang Jun Ho and that together the pair will end up going to the island in order to stop the games. Ji Hun was gassed during transport so he doesn't know how to get there. However, Huang Jun Ho does if he made it out and managed to swim back to the mainland. With Ji Hun's resources and newfound life, he'll be able to equip Huang Jun Ho with the necessary means to take down the Squid Game gang. This is obviously a big turn up for the books as one of the lessons he learned in his mother's death was not to abandon those that loved him, but he's very much abandoning hundreds of people to their deaths if he decides to travel to LA. He's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't and I see this more as an ending in which he's sacrificing his own happiness in order to help others. Again, this is something that Ilnam would never do and thus it's a great signal of the character coming full circle. Now there are other potentials for season 2 and we do know that the games have been going on for decades. There's evidence they even existed in the 80s and it would be interesting to explore not only their origins but also Ilnams who of course founded them. There's also the fact that these are being run internationally and though it's a long shot, I'd love to see Netflix bring in the European and Western games as a series to show us what was happening there before we build to an overarching narrative involving all the winners. 
Either way, there's a lot of potential directions they could take it. And I have to say, I absolutely love this season and can't wait to see more. It was absolutely gripping not knowing who would live and die, and it made for a season that I happily binged in one day just to get to what the outcome would be. This is a great character study that really gets to the meat of what it means to survive when it costs others so much, and I think the show handled a lot of its elements in spectacular fashion. Whenever a Korean show comes out on Netflix, I always try and cover it, as they're pretty much brilliant across the board, and this is no different. Squid Game pulled me right in, and because of that, it gets a 9.5 out of 10. Now obviously, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the season, and apologies if I butchered the pronunciation of any of the names. Comment below and let me know, and as a thank you for interacting with the video, you'll be entered into a prize draw on the 30th of September, in which we're giving away 3 copies of Zack Snyder's DC Trilogy. All you have to do to be on with a chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the season. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers if that's you. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of What If Episode 6, which will be linked on screen right now. We went over the full episode and pointed out all the easter eggs in it, so it's definitely worth checking out if you're a Marvel maniac. With that out of the way, thank you for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you in the next one. Take care, peace. Squid Game's ending reveals that O.L. Nam, the oldest player in the games, is actually the founder of the games. So, what are the clues that alluded to this fact? Squid Game's final episode revealed that O.L. Nam, or O. Young Soo, is the founder and financier of the games, and there are actually several clues to this twist that are hidden throughout the survival drama series. As the oldest player involved in the Twisted Death games, the lovable O.L. Nam is easily one of the reasons why Squid Game became the most watched show out of Netflix's September 2021 releases. But, when Il Nam's true identity is revealed during the final episode of Squid Game, many audience members and along with the protagonist, Seong Gi-hun, were treated to a harsh awakening. As the brains behind the entire Squid Game operation, Il Nam represents the billionaires in a series that digs deep into the topic of wealth and equality. Out of the show's desperate and deeply indebted players, Il Nam is the only one whose choice to participate in the games isn't burdened by nuance. While the other players had to choose between living their lives in debt, or risking their lives in Squid Game for the chance to win a fortune, Il Nam was just literally there to try and have some fun. There are many clues that point to Il Nam being much more than he appears to be. However, the old man certainly knew how to keep his secrets until the last moment. Prior to that, he was just the lovable old man whom Squid Game used to pull audiences' heartstrings. But on the second viewing of Squid Game, the clues about Il Nam's true identity become much more obvious. Il Nam's numeric designation means that he was the first player chosen for the game. While this fact is taken for granted at the start of Squid Game, it's slowly revealed throughout the series that the other 455 players are around the ages of 20 to 40. The fact that Il Nam is the first chosen player, despite being decades older than everyone else, was the first clue regarding his true identity. Also, in the first game of Red Light Green Light, the robot designed to detect flinching Squid Game players didn't target Il Nam at all. While everyone else's Squid Game tracksuit had a green overlay, Il Nam and the player near him didn't have one at all. This could indicate that the robot was programmed to spare Il Nam, which also affected those near him, as Squid Game's organizers couldn't risk harming their founder. Also, the star shape is one of the easiest shapes to carve out of the honeycomb tree using a needle, and Il Nam chose this shape for himself. While the triangle shape is arguably easier to carve out, the star has even shorter lines and requires even less skill. Despite being old and slow, Il Nam easily carves out the star without using any tricks or special techniques. Also, when fighting breaks out in the dormitory room, every player was in danger and powerless to stop the fighting. But when Il Nam asks organizers to interfere, squid game workers and guards are immediately sent in by the front man to take back control of the room. While letting the fighting continue would be good for the games, front man had to interfere before Il Nam was in any real danger. Now we also see what is perhaps the most glaring clue that Il Nam is not as helpless as he seems. As revealed by Il Nam's strategy for winning against a much stronger team, he is practically a master of tug of war. While Il Nam's excuse of having played the game frequently as a child is believable, this actually reveals the extent to which he prepared for taking part in the games. Also, how El Nam described the neighborhood setting for the marble game 
was dismissed by many as the mere ramblings of an old man suffering from dementia. But as Squid Game's ending reveals, the setting was an accurate recreation of Il Nam's old home. This could have been the front man's way of making the marble game even more exciting for the founder of the games. Moreover, the geometric shapes that were on display at the house Il Nam identified as his home are the same shapes found on the Squid Game cards. And lastly, when the camera pans out to show the dead players after the marble game, Il Nam's corpse was nowhere to be found. Now, one other clue is that he doesn't have a player profile. This clue rushes by so quickly that very few viewers actually caught it. During episode 5 of Squid Game, Police Officer, Guang Junho infiltrates the front man's inner sanctum and finds files on all the previous and current players. The massive archive of comprehensive files goes back decades, chronicling every single one of those who were unfortunate enough to be included in Squid Game's cast of doomed characters. But when the officer finds the folder for the current iteration of the games, the first page skips to player 2. The file for player 1 is nowhere to be found, as it is unnecessary. Apart from the fact that Il Nam was not a real player, having a file of him in the archives would be a liability. Not just for the organization, but for Il Nam's VIP clients. Also, Il Nam's wide smile throughout the different death games is reflective of his outlook on life, as he explained to Gi Hun, that during a second viewing of Squid Game, this smile takes on a more sinister context. And like every other player, who is risking their life for the chance to win Squid Game's 45.6 billion Korean won prize, he's just there to have a bit of fun before he dies. Moreover, the fact that Il Nam used his brain tumor and impending death to justify flashing an authentic smile as other players are eliminated around him, is quite telling of just what kind of person the Squid Game founder truly is. Also, the Korean character, Il, can mean day, work, or first. Meanwhile, the second character, Nam, can be translated to boy or man. This means that Il Nam's name actually translates to first man. While this could refer to how Il Nam is also known as player one, it could also just as easily refer to the saw-like twist in the ending, in which he is revealed to be the founder of Squid Game. Thank you for watching, drop a like and tell us down below what you think.